and yeah, I need to come clean about this matter. And so I'm going to reveal it straight away. Photographers on YouTube are lying to you and I'm guilty of it myself. Also, gear most definitely matters, but not in the way you think. Now, as photographers, we are always asked which settings we use to take a photo. And I get it, you like the photo, thanks for that, and you would like to be able to take a similar photo yourself. There is absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to learn what it takes to make an image. And here on YouTube, I have received negative feedback whenever I did not add the settings next to the photos in my videos. So I do it as it seemed to be a recurring request. Problem is, these settings don't really matter. And not only that, they are wrong. I mean, they helped me take the photo for sure, but would you take the same photo using the exact same settings? Unfortunately for you, that is unlikely. And the issue here is mainly threefold. It has to do with camera system, light condition and post-processing. So let me quickly elaborate on all three. Now, when I went to Florence with the GFX 50S Mark II, Fujifilm gave me a pre-production camera that had not been released yet. This meant that no software was compatible with the raw files at the time. So I mainly shot JPEGs and because I couldn't edit my photos, I showed you the images straight out of camera in the videos. But the vast majority of times, most photographers and I shoot in RAW, which means that we run our photos through editing apps before we publish them. And so we adjust sharpness to counter the default softness of RAW files, we may lift the shadows because we shot a little underexposed to save details in the light, we tone down the whites for less contrast so the photos look more cinematic, Maybe we bump up a color a little so it pops more, etc, etc. And so already, even if the edits are ever so subtle and this is never done maliciously to mislead you in any way, you can tell that the photo you end up seeing is not the one we captured. Though it's probably the one we had in mind when we shot. And at least many now show you the before and after in the videos, even if this is usually a trick to sell you the presets like I'm doing now. But for the sake of not making our videos too tedious, this is often overlooked and the editing info is not displayed clearly. Now, when it comes to my photography, the good thing about shooting with Fujifilm is that the colors are already fantastic. So I almost always show you images here that are not edited beyond uh, fixing the flaws of the RAW files. But then even with no post-processing, I use film simulations in camera. So what if your camera is from a different brand? But let's assume that the photos you see are unedited. When someone writes down the gear slash settings combo that is used to take a photo, it is often information that is useful only to people using the same system. And there are several different camera systems these days, regardless of the brand. And the main difference is in the sensor size. Without going too technical, you can imagine that a larger sensor lets more light in and can capture more details. But it also affects every piece of information that is provided to you. For example, let's take the 23mm f2 I often use in my street photography. You would think that a 23mm lens is the same 23mm in every camera. But it's a wrong assumption. The common standard is based on what is today defined as full frame, which is the sensor size here. So if you have a full frame camera and you buy a 23mm lens, that yes, that is indeed 23mm. But my main camera today, for example, is the Fujifilm X-T4, which is an APS-C camera. The sensor is slightly smaller, hence why it is often referred to as crop sensor. And a full frame sensor is 1.53 times larger than the one I use. Therefore, my 23mm is actually equivalent to 23 times 1.53, or roughly 35mm. And the crop factor applies to the aperture as well, which is not something everybody knows. This means that my wider aperture f2 is in fact something more likely between f2.8 and f3.2. So do you see now where this is going? These are the settings I apply to take this photo with my camera and the settings are correct. But to actually be helpful to you, the screen should be more like this. But let's say that all these variables don't matter. If every camera is the same or you just use my same camera and if no edits are applied, then of course this must mean that by using my same settings, you will finally be able to make my same photo. And well, theoretically yes, but that is if the light conditions are the same. Now, different times of the day, different weather conditions, different cities, all create different light conditions. But let's assume even these are identical. Okay, so bear with me now. 
this is going to be the most technical part, but it's also the most useful to you. So if you understand what I'm about to show you, there is no limit to what you can achieve. And you will never need to ask about settings anymore. Now, in photography, all that matters to taking a photo is the amount of light that hits the camera sensor. Setting the ISO, the aperture and the shutter speed in a certain way indicates to the camera how much light should be allowed in. They then affect the final result in different ways. And for example, if, you, if the shutter speed is low, you will probably see more movement. But the rationale is the same. The values determine how much light hits the sensor. And therefore, they could be interchangeable. You could take the exact same photo regardless of your ISO setting, for example. 100, 200, 400, in principle, it doesn't matter, as long as the other two values change accordingly. Now, here's a clear visual representation that will make much more sense in a moment. Now, if we look at this photo, this was shot during my recent trip to Istanbul, which you will know everything about if you subscribe to the channel. Anyway, if you look at this photo, this was taken at ISO 100, uh, aperture f8 and 1000th of a second. But the result would have been identical if this was shot at ISO 200, f13 and 1800th of a second. Because of how the parameters interact and work within the camera, the amount of light that hits the sensor with these settings is the same as with these other settings. Now, you can pause the video and take a screenshot if it helps you. Or you can watch this again to help the algorithm. Anyway. It's your subject that detects the settings and therefore the photo. And how the lights hit the subject. It's not the settings that make the photo. And so, are you shooting a static landscape? Then, take the ISO down to avoid noise, set the aperture for the depth of field that you require, and then move the shutter speed accordingly. Or, are you shooting action like street photography or sport? Then, set a shutter speed fast enough to freeze movement, and play with the rest based on what you want to achieve. And, and by the way, don't be afraid of high ISO. It's better to take a photo with some grain than to not take a photo at all. And so, the settings I use to take a photo shouldn't really matter to you. I will keep including the information in my video so that you will have a starting point. But what's important is that you know your camera, not mine. And you learn how to quickly adjust ISO, aperture and shutter speed to achieve the image you want. But if that's not enough, learning some basic editing will also help elevate the image. And there are videos on this channel that will help you with that. This video here is a good example and it doesn't take long to take your photography to where you want. So, watch this now, subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!